Since July 20th, 1993, when the body of Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster was found at Fort Marcy Park, the American government, and more importantly the American press, have concealed the true facts of the death from the American people. Now, ten years later, we hear from the leading government investigator that Vince Foster did not die the way officials have said. We now learn firsthand from the person in charge of Independent Counsel Kenneth Starr's Foster death investigation that Starr's investigation was a sham and that its conclusion was determined even before the investigation began. Investigators altered the crime scene and a few people controlled the outcome of the investigation. The press controlled how it would be reported. You are about to hear the voice of Miguel Rodriguez, a United States attorney working in Sacramento, California. Mr. Rodriguez resigned from Kenneth Starr's Office of Independent Counsel in the spring of 1995 when Kenneth Starr's staff frustrated his investigation. Mr. Rodriguez resigned because he refused to join the others in covering up Foster's murder. Mr. Rodriguez revealed the truth to over 100 people, journalists, congressmen, senators, and others in his attempt to get the facts of the case to the public. What you will hear are actual excerpts from some of these conversations. Only the voice of Mr. Rodriguez is heard in these excerpts to protect confidential sources. In this first segment, you will hear that Vincent Foster did not die the way Kenneth Starr's predecessor Robert Fisk had said. The evidence does not support the conclusion of suicide. Okay, all I know is that things did not happen the way Fisk said that they happened, and the reports don't support what Fisk said. There, there's really nothing that's consistent with him, um, you know, committing that kind of a violent, or that kind of a violent act at all. Well, it did not happen the way Fisk said it happened. One fact about Foster's death was the first rescue workers to arrive at the body saw very little blood. People who arrived later saw much more blood. Robert Fisk and Kenneth Starr falsely claimed that a quantity of blood was observed where the body was first discovered. Another false story by Fisk and Starr is that an early observer, a rescue worker, had moved Foster's head to check for a pulse. By the way, you know why there was blood, by the way? What happened is there was, at the time they got there, and the body was in the position that it was in, there was virtually no blood anywhere, um, then there's, there are some conflicting reports about there being blood later on. Later, an EMT sees blood, and how it sees blood. Well, the reason is very clear. They lifted the body and pulled it to the top of the ridge, the top of the berm, and once they did that, blood started flowing fast, and then when they took the body and put it into the body bag, which was right, you know, in other words, they body's on a slope. Then they pull the body up to the top of the berm. When the body is horizontal or even at the top of the berm, it's not quite horizontal. It's a little bit of a back slope. All of a sudden, the blood starts gushing out. There's a lot of blood then under the body. Miguel Rodriguez explains that the body was moved in the presence of Park Police Officer John Rolla with the knowledge of medical examiner Dr. Donald Hout and others. Rescue worker Corey Ashford arrived to pick up Foster's body after it had already been moved. Crime scene photographs of the body as it was originally found apparently vanished. Exactly, but Corey's also the one who, that's when the body's in the upright, not in the upright, but in the, uh, in a uh, uh, supine position um, on the top of the berm already, in other words, different than the, from the Ashford and the persons who actually lift the body into the body bag don't see the body in its original position. They see it in a horizontal position, um, having been moved from a vertical position. And so when it's in the horizontal position, there is blood coagulating under the body before it goes into the body bag. That explains the difference in, in there being bought of blood. And that's what Hout sees also. Hout asks that the body be rolled um, when it's in a horizontal position. So when Hout sees the body, the body's in a horizontal position state. And yes, there's going to be blood. You see, so how it actually sees the body in two positions, and people are conveniently using different phrases of how to justify whatever result they want. Sure, how it says, on one hand, there is no blood. Then he says, on the other hand, there is blood. In fact, a number of people have said there's a small amount where the body was originally found. 
Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes, and Jim Wooten of ABC News, along with other journalists, hoodwinked the public by broadcasting that there was plenty of blood where Foster's body was found. There was more tampering with the crime scene when the FBI re-landscaped the park where Foster's body was found, destroying evidence of park trails and entrances. And do you really know what the egress and, 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 and access is uh, to the park? You have to go back to 1993. You have to go back to prior to the body being found and find out what access there was we know about what access, um, and how has it changed? But that's the whole point. You, you, again, you guys really have to understand, they've re-landscaped it prior to this. You know, they, they've changed gates, they've changed paths, they've changed trees, they've filled the gullies, they've de- redefined the slope. You, you, you know, the whole thing was changed when I was there. The whole area has been re-landscaped. Officially, Foster was found with a black Colt revolver in his hand. But that's not what the first witnesses saw. Richard Arthur, a paramedic at the scene, saw an automatic pistol. The investigators ignored this gun. The gun officially found in Foster's hand was not the same gun seen in Foster's hand when the first rescue workers arrived. Even the park police... Even the park police and the person who first saw the body uh, saw different things. Was there a point in time where the particular gun that you described arrives and something before that is either not observed or, or not completely identified? Both paramedics at the scene saw a bullet wound in Vince Foster's neck. Miguel Rodriguez reviewed photographs of the body at the scene and also saw the trauma to Foster's neck. Fisk's report falsely stated, quote, The photographs taken at the scene conclusively show that there were no such wounds, unquote. Starr's report states that the witness who saw the bullet wound in the neck, quote, may have been mistaken, unquote. Both EMTs, you remember that? When you have an emergency and you call the fire department, they will send their normal crew, and each crew may have an EMT with them, uh, who is a specially trained fire department person. Both EMTs that responded to the park both observed trauma to the neck. Well, Arthur remained clear on it despite the FBI's attempt to shake him. The other one was confused by the FBI and kept saying what he saw, but they kept writing it a different way. I saw pictures that clearly indicate to me that there is trauma on the neck. I believe it's a puncture wound in the neck. Kenneth Starr's report on Foster's death states, quote, According to Secret Service records, the Secret Service was notified of Mr. Foster's death at about 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time on July 20th, unquote. Paramedics and rescue workers were called at 6 p.m., and according to Miguel Rodriguez, the White House knew well before the first 911 call was placed. Now, there's indications that the White House and others knew prior to the time it was initially said to be discovered. There was notification made well before the time that EMTs were called. Reporters and editors have deceived people by publicizing the foolish idea that too many people would have to be involved for a cover-up to remain secret. There aren't that many people that know things, really. No, you don't need a lot of people to know what's going on. In fact, you don't need many at all. Everyone makes a very big mistake when they believe that a lot of people are necessary to orchestrate some kind of, uh, some result here. Very few people need to know anything about anything, really. All... All people need to know is what their job is, not why. Be a good soldier, carry out the orders. And there are a lot of people, from that, starting at the very night the body was investigated, all the way down the line, there were, there were people told to do certain things and they didn't, and their 
a nation now is, I was following orders, told me told what to do. Nobody, um, and this goes all to the FBI agents. They don't, they don't necessarily know the big picture. They don't know what other people are writing in their reports. There's, you know, when you write a report, all you have to do is make sure that it's consistent with the most innocuous thing is to make sure it's consistent with the results that you ultimately want to get, which is not embarrass your other colleagues who have made a conclusion already. All you need is some, is some motivation that is that simple, and, and you know, all of a sudden your notes don't, don't exactly reflect what other people have said. It's very simple. It's a very, a very uh, clean formula to achieve the result. You don't need to know the big picture. All you need to do is just have a couple of people involved. In other words, if Ron and, you know, two or three others are out there assisting in making this all go smoothly, right? And they're the ones who are ultimately collecting all the notes from the other officers, right? Then they, all they do is submit their own notes and their final report. You see, you know, you have very few people, okay, that you go out there and you, you uh, talk to those people, interview them, and I'll be over in a little while. You know, you come over, you get her notes, and then you write the report. Your report's wrong. You hope no one's ever going to catch you on it. But if they do, so what? You know, the thing gets obscured and obscured and obscured because you, you've controlled the central figures in the investigation. You don't need all these park police and all these FBI agents to know the overall scheme. The FBI conducted the first investigation along with the Park Police. The FBI reinvestigated Foster's death under independent counsel Fisk. Then, Kenneth Starr used the very same FBI agents for his investigation. The American press misled the public by falsely reporting that there have been several independent investigations, when in fact, all of the investigations were done by the FBI. Star can only be as good as, the, you know, how independent can Star really be when he is being supplied by the very same agency, uh, you know, with his investigative team, the same agency that did the investigation under question, the same people. Another member of Star's investigation was Mark Tuohy, the former president of the District of Columbia's bar. Mark Tuohy squelched efforts by Miguel Rodriguez to issue subpoenas and call witnesses. You know, the... the the games that are being played with people, you know, like uh, Tui and, and even the young aspiring people, you know, and, you know, who I used to work with back in that office, that they, you know, who will, will say and do what they have to do to move up the ladder. It's not just Tui, you know, there's a lot of people that are very, very interested in controlling the results here. Well, I wrote that to Star back in January of, of this year and then in December of this year, and it was squelched by by Tui. He could be louder than I could. He was a team player, and, you know, I know. My office was searched by him, you know. Um, I know what he's capable of doing. That includes throwing a tantrum and throwing chairs. Unable to call witnesses and issue subpoenas, and under control of the Democrat Mark Tui and compromise. You know, it's in, the, it's in many Republicans' interests to not rock the boat, because what we're talking about is ultimate power. Clearly, the American press participated in the cover-up of Foster's murder. Miguel Rodriguez reached out and told, quote, over 100, unquote, reporters, much more than you are hearing today. The American press only parroted the official lie that they were spoon-fed by Kenneth Starr's Office of Independent Counsel. I've talked to a number of people, that, you know, from Time Magazine, Newsweek, you know, Nightline, the New York Times, Boston Globe, Atlanta, whatever, um, you know, there have been well over a hundred, and this this matter is so sealed tight, um, and the reporters are all genuinely interested, but the um, the uh, um, the report the edit, the reporters are genuinely interested, but the uh, when they get sort of excited and and they've got a story and they're ready to go, the editors. And they, I've gotten calls back. I've gotten calls back from all kinds of magazines worldwide. Saying, what the hell's wrong? Why can't, you know, you were telling me that you, you didn't think to go anywhere. And sure enough, I wrote the story. They went to all the trouble of writing, and then they got killed. Again, I, I've, you know, I spent almost 11 hours with, with 
with Labaton or six hours with Labaton. And, uh, you know, I know the guy knows um, that there's a lot more... Um, uh, and I, know, I know the New York Times has a, a knows, and I just won't... Uh, uh, I know that they won't do anything about it, and I, I do know that that many people have called me back, reporters that I've spent a lot of time with, called me back and said the editors won't allow it to go to press. The accepted media here has always had uh, a certain take on all of this, and there's been storylines from the get-go. There never really was an investigation of Vince Foster's death. There was only the appearance of an investigation. Park Police Investigator Cheryl Braun admitted that the determination that the death was a suicide was made prior to her going up and looking at Foster's body. The Fisk and Star investigations were result-oriented. Miguel Rodriguez resigned because he would not be part of an investigation with a foregone conclusion. This uh, result is being dictated by a lot higher uh, authority than... I think people really understand or appreciate, and certainly more than I ever appreciated. This whole notion, uh, you know, of 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 doing an honest investigation, um, you know, it, you know, it is is laughable. I knew what the result was going to be because I was told what the result was going to be from the get go. And uh, this is all so much fluff and a look good job. This is this is all all so much nonsense. I knew. The result before the investigation began. That's why I left. I don't do investigations like that. I do investigations to justify results. There's a reason. Again, I only can go back to the fact that, and it's just a fact for me because it was told to me. The result here has already been determined. It was determined long ago. Fisk himself indicated that he had determined the result before he had ever released a report. You know, that's the way all of these investigations have resulted. It's ends-oriented. Again, you know, I left for a very good reason. The result, you know, was dictated. I don't do that kind of work. Who has the power to threaten a United States attorney without consequence? Miguel Rodriguez was threatened. He was threatened professionally, physically, and personally. It was the independent counsel themselves and the FBI beat me back and in fact threatened me told me to quote this is a quote back off or, or it was either back off or back down they used both of them you know I it's I have I have been communicated with again and told you know to, to uh, be careful where I tread I can tell you this that uh, um, it has not only to do with my career and reputation um but it also has to do with my personal uh, health and my family. The Jason Blairs are only a distraction from what is wrong with the American press. The ongoing problem is the owners and editors that continue to protect the people who threatened Miguel Rodriguez. As long as the criminal cover-up of Vince Foster's murder continues, the journalism profession deserves the scorn of the American public.